Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I call this meeting of the Committee on Workforce and Business Development, Finance and Policy Tour. Uh, members and the public also, uh, if you can mute your mic as we get started. This remote hearing is being conducted pursuant to Rule 10.01. This remote hearing can be viewed at House Television Webcast. The Committee Legislative Assistant, uh, Jason Chavez. Uh, Mr. Chavez, please take the roll. Chair Noor. Present. Chair Noor, present. Vice Chair Jay Jong, I believe will be excused. Lead Hamilton. Present. Lead Hamilton, present. Baker. Baker. Dabney. Dabney, present. Dabney, present. Frankie. Frankie, present. Frankie, present. Greenman. Present. Greenman, present. Haley. Haley. Jurgens. Jurgens, present. Jurgens, present. Kegel. Kegel, present. Kegel, present. Katiza Watoon. Present. Katiza Watoon, present. Olsen. Present. Olsen, present. Tujong. Tujong. Baker. Baker. Haley. Haley. And Baker is getting into the room right now and is present. Mr. Chair, we have quorum. And we can't hear you, Mr. Chair, you're on mute. Uh, there's a quorum present, so that means we will get uh, started as we wait other members to join us. Uh, members, uh, I just wanted to ask and entertain a motion to approve the minutes uh, for the March 15, 2021. So moved, Mr. Chair. Late arrival, Representative Baker. Representative Baker moves the approval for the minutes of March 15, 2021. Any discussions? Any discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Seeing none, the motion prevails. The minutes for March 15 are now approved. With that, members, we do have uh, several bills before us today. Uh, I don't know if the presenters have been able to join the uh, the session uh, before I call on the bills. Uh, we will uh, try our best to end on time. We were late in terms of beginning the session because of the the flow actions that we just had. So, is uh, Representative Hassan with us? Mr. Chair, our representative Hassan has not joined the meeting at this time yet. With that, I, maybe we should start with, the two, with my two bills. Uh, the first one, I'll, I'll transfer the uh, chairmanship to uh, Representative Greenman. Uh, you take the charge and I will present the first bill, which we have is uh, uh, House File 1630. Uh, thank you. Um, members, the, this bill on our agenda is House File 1630 from Representative Knorr. Uh, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Madam Chair. I would like to move House File 1630 to be placed, uh, to be re referred to Ways and Means. Representative Knorr moves House File 1630 to be re referred to Ways and Means. Uh, it looks like you have an author's amendment, the A1 amendment. Would you like to explain your amendment? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the A1 amendment takes into account uh, the issue that we've had from many districts and cities and local government in regards to the MIF funding, Minnesota Investment Fund, where they have not been able to conduct the activities required under the requirement of Minnesota Investment Program. I just wanted to ask uh, the Deputy Commissioner, Kevin McKinnon, just to give us a little bit brief on some of the challenges that we have had from different localities, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Nair. Uh, uh, Mr. McKinnon, to that amendment. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and uh, Representative Noor. Um, basically, the amendment that's before you today um, uh, talks about um, some of the requirements that we have essentially in law uh, and I think it's good for you all to know 
uh, around our Minnesota Investment Fund and Job Creation Fund programs. These programs, um, when we utilize them, have um, business subsidy requirements that the businesses have to um, adhere to, uh, and as such, um, uh, basically guide how we um, work with the the businesses uh, that um, that are receiving the MIF and JCF funds. Uh, so we know there are a number of businesses out there um, with existing subsidy agreements uh, that this does impact. Uh, and uh, this bill before you today would basically give some relief to those businesses uh, under the um, uh, peacetime emergency sort of time frame. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, there's, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 agreements, basically, in the last few number of years um, that obviously this, this could impact at some point. Uh, now, it's not all businesses, but there are uh, certainly businesses out there that we know of and probably most members have heard from in their communities. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Are there any, do members have any questions on the amendment? Any questions? Okay, you can get to a vote. All in favor of adopting the A1 amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries as adopted. Uh, Representative North, to your amended, to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. I know you have had uh, from many of your constituents and also the businesses that have been impacted, the House File 1630 as amended uh, will definitely resolve some of those issues and ensure that deed can allow the business to continue with their projected uh, investment. Uh, overall, the bill, I think, as uh, the Deputy Commissioner explained, will address that issue, and we're hoping to uh, address that issue from various individuals. And as I promised uh, uh, the lead, uh, I'll take care of some of the some of the jurisdiction. Instead of having uh, individual bills, this bill will take care of those issues that we've talked about. And I just wanted to see if uh, Deputy Commissioner wanted to really further address the root causes of some of the uh, issues facing not only uh, MIF, but J uh, Job Creation Fund and other funds that they're they have to resolve those issues at this moment. Mr. McKinnon. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members. Um, so basically, uh, when business subsidy law requires certain um, job numbers, wage numbers, uh, investment numbers uh, that um, that we put into effect when we do agreements with businesses. Uh, and as such, they're given two years uh, to achieve those uh, requirements basically uh, across the programs. Under existing authority, we have um, uh, essentially one year uh, for which we can work with businesses uh, that are substantially along their uh, trajectory or pathway. Um, and we work with the local communities obviously to extend that. Um, but uh, really what this is, uh, this amendment is allowing uh, is a little bit more time beyond that one year, uh, particularly in the case of the Minnesota Investment Fund. Um, and that's really what this is, what this is getting at. Um, I think it's good that uh, you all are, are aware that there are um, actions that guide what we do uh, upon um, default or um, uh, with businesses that cannot uh, or are not achieving what they've uh, set out to do. Uh, and as such, uh, it's our job to go back and get that money back and, and put it back into our accounts. Uh, and so once again, this amendment just allows for a little bit more uh, time. And yes, uh, we've worked with um, uh, the author here uh, on this language and it would do as intended. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Members, are there any questions? Representative Jurgens. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And I was, everybody just kind of getting settled here at the beginning, and I and so I missed this. Could uh, Mr. Chair, could you please remind us uh, what the path is for this bill? Are we laying it over, or what are, what's the plan today? Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Representative Jergens, uh, the motion was to go to Ways and Means. It'll be referred to Ways and Means. Okay, thank you. Representative Jergens, you're good. Uh, Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and uh, Chair Noor. I uh, also want to thank you for working with us on this. And I understand the, the need for the extension and everything. I also want to uh, say to the department, thank you for gathering this information. Um, it's something that we need, obviously, as uh, legislators and, and policymakers to make sure that uh, the programs that we have in place are, are working and are, um, um, we're meeting those goals. Uh, the individuals are meeting the goals who are eligible or receiving the grant. So thank you for that. Uh, Representative Hamilton. Good. Any follow-up? No, <laughs> thank a you, comment. Madam Chair. I thought I put my hand down. So <laughs> um, any other questions? Uh, Representative Noor, any closing comments? Uh, no further comments. Uh, I, uh, I ask for your support. So thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Noor renews his motion that House File 1630, as amended, be referred to Ways and Means. The Legislative uh, um, Committee Assistant will take the roll. Chair Noor? Aye. Chair Noor, aye. Vice, Vice Chair Jay Jong, excused. Lead Hamilton? Aye. Lead Hamilton, aye. Baker? Baker, aye. Baker, aye. Daphne? Daphne, aye. Daphne, aye. Frankie? Frankie, aye. Frankie, aye. Greenman? Aye. Greenman, aye. Haley? Haley? Jurgens? Jurgens, aye. Jurgens, aye. Cagle? Cagle, aye. Cagle, aye. Katiza Watoon? Aye. Katiza Watoon, aye. Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Tujong? Aye. Tujong, aye. Haley? Haley? Mr. Chair, with 11 ayes, um, two excused, the motion prevailed. There being 11 ayes and two excused, oh, motion, <laughs> uh, the motion passes and the bill is on its way to Ways and Means. Uh, the next bill we have um, is House File 1784 uh, from Representative... Madam, Madam, Madam Chair, I just wanted to go back to the original schedule. I see Representative Hassan and also Tu Zhong, so I didn't want to take the time. I will wait for that bill uh, uh, Mr. for the Chair, end. the gavel's back to you. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, the next bill on our schedule is House File 389, uh, Representative Hassan. Welcome to the committee, and uh, would like to move your bill to be re referred to Education Finance. Uh, Please um, uh, welcome and uh, tell, you know, I see you also have a D D1 amendment uh, to put the bill in a shape uh, that addresses some of those issues. Yes, Mr. Chair, want... thank you. Um, I would like to speak on, on um, the DE amendment, DE1 amendment. So I move uh, the DE1 amendment uh, did you want to explain uh, DE1 amendment, please? Um, yes, Mr. Chair and members, um, DE1 amendment just um, changed dates. This bill is not a new bill. It was introduced in 2019 by Chair Moran. Uh, so it changed some geographic, um, you know, it was first limited to only Ramsey County and now we're making it statewide and we're changing some dates and uh, putting uh, appropriation um, numbers in, in the bill. Uh, Representative Hamilton, I see you raised your hand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm reading through the DE amendment now. I see that it was posted at 12.01 and we had session at 12.15. So I'm trying to get through it. Um, uh, Representative Hassan, on Article 6 and Article 7, I believe are still left blank. Um, do you have um, dollar amounts for those two articles? Representative Hassan. Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Hamilton, no, we do not have at this time a dollar amount, and the bill is going to 
education finance, and we still have some work to do on it. Lynn Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hodan. Um, you know, that's, uh, I brought this up on a separate bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it looks like Article 6 and Article 7, uh, we do have jurisdiction within this committee. And I feel uneasy passing bills out of this committee, not knowing how those dollars are going to be spent, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if uh, you or anybody else can share some light on that. Uh, but I just don't feel comfortable moving these bills out without appropriations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Lee Hamilton. I think, as you are aware of, uh, there's no budget that will be coming out of our target without us having that conversation as we go through the omnibus bill. Uh, if any, any of those bills become part of our package, uh, the intent is to make sure that we can get this bill in front of the education committee so they can address the programs that are listed under their jurisdiction. Uh, obviously, uh, we don't have the jurisdiction over the, the funding through uh, the Department of Education. I don't know if that will help uh, to explain the uh, the amendment that is before us. So uh, just clarification, Mr. Chairman, then yes, I, I do believe, like I said, I'm, I'm reading it now, but I do believe Article 6 and Article 7 would be under our jurisdiction within this committee. I understand the Education Committee, absolutely understand that. Would we then bring this back this bill back to this committee after it goes to the education committee, Mr. Chairman? Uh, that's our hope, uh, Lead Hamilton. So te technically, uh, some of those components stay within uh, our jurisdiction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To, uh, for those, um, all those in favor of the uh, DE1 amendment, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The motion prevails. Uh, with that, uh, Representative Hassan, uh, to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members, for the opportunity to present the Women of Color Opportunity Act today. This is not a new legislation, as I said. As many of you in this committee has voted for this legislation in 2019 when Chair Moran uh, carried the bill. <clears throat> According to research, women of color are integral to the economic stability of their families. Any erosion of their earnings would be disastrous, worsening instability and robbing families of essential resources. Data consistently shows that across all family structures, women of color play a vital role in providing economic support on which their families rely on to make ends meet. In families with children, many of women of color who are mothers are also breadwinners, meaning that they're the sole earners for their family to earn as much as, as much or more than their partners. Long-standing structural inequities fueled by racism, sexism, ethnic stereotypes, and other forms of bias have created an uneven landscape that makes it difficult for many women of color to secure jobs with solid wages and opportunity for advancement. Access to quality health care that is timely and responsive reside in communities which the essential services are, are, which are necessary to live in healthy lives. <clears throat> Women of color in the United States experience the nation's persistent and unescapable gender gap, gender wage gaps most severely. The gap represents the tangible consequences of sexism and systemic inequities in the United States in, and even in our great state of Minnesota. This is an example of how our, our country's systemic systemically devalues women of color, their contribution to society, as well as their labor. According to US census data, Latinx women typically make, are paid typically 55 cents for every dollar that's paid to white non-Hispanic men. Native American women are paid typically just 60 cents for every dollar that's paid to white male. Black women are typically paid 63 cents for every dollar that's paid to white male and Asian women are paid 87 cents for every dollar that's paid to white men. These are not just opinions, but rather some hardcore facts that impact parts of our society and some of the reasons why many in the PIPA communities are trapped in cycle of poverty. If we truly care about eliminating disparities as a state, we must remove systemic barriers that hold women of color back and prevent them from living the American dream many of us have and others so direly want. House file 
384 addresses some of the core issues that impact women of color in the workplace and hopefully removes systemic barriers. Our conversation with women of color and girls around the state has produced the change in this bill. The different articles in this bill uh, address the need that and, and the want that came from one of women of color. Article two addresses women of color uh, business development and loan program. Uh, the commissioner must make grants eligible to organizations to provide loans for startup, expansion, retention of small businesses that are owned by women of color and to provide technical assistance in collaboration with Minnesota's communities of color and organizations that serve women of color. We heard uh, conversations with women of color across the state. We heard that uh, many of them who would have the uh, entrepreneurship spirit that didn't have either didn't know where to start or didn't know who can help or the ones that own businesses don't have anybody to help them with technical support or assist them if there was a problem with their businesses. Article three uh, addresses competitive grant programs to increase financial literacy. We know knowledge is power. And if we teach young women uh, of color financial literacy early on in life, we know that would liberate them from being trapped in poverty and that they would make, that, that for sure they will make smart decisions about money. Uh, Article four, uh, you know, addresses a pilot grant program to encourage girls of color to ex explore and pursue STEM careers. Women of color only make up 12% of STEM professionals. The commissioner shall award one grant to an eligible organization serving uh, girls of color and one grant to an eligible that's serving girls of color in one or more of the counties in greater Minnesota. The eligible organizations receiving this grant must use the grant to fund uh, grant funds to encourage and support girls of color in exploring and pursuing STEM careers. Article four <clears throat> uh, addresses a pilot uh, grant program to increase the academic success, success of girls of color. And then Article 5, um, Article 6, I mean, addresses the high wage uh, and high demand and traditional job grants. And yes, as uh, Representative Hamilton ad addressed, there is no dollar amount for uh, Article 6 or Article 7. But I will say that we this is a work in progress and we are still working on this. And hopefully um, we will have more conversations about this. Uh, but this, it, this uh, article, um, appropriates money uh, from the general fund to the commissioner of employment and economic development for high wage, high demand, and traditional jobs grant program under Minnesota statute section 116L.99. And article seven addresses an, in an internship program with Women's Foundation for young women of color. We know that many young women of color, even if they like go to school, get their degree, um, still it's not what you know a lot of times in the professional world. It's who you know, it's who can get you in the door, who can uh, you know, introduce you to an opportunity. So uh, this article will address that barrier. With that, Mr. Chair, I have a um, young woman who are gonna testify to the need for this bill and we'll stand for questions. Thank you, uh, Representative Hassan. I see uh, Ms. Mola, uh, Luleta Mola. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and uh, the entity you represent and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Hello, my name is Lulit Mola and I serve as the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer at the Women's Foundation of Minnesota. It is my honor to be here today in support of the Women of Color Opportunity Act. I wanna thank Representative Hassan and the original author of a similar bill, Representative Moran, for their leadership and vision in ensuring equitable access to women across the state. So what is the Women's Foundation of Minnesota? Well, simply put, we are a community organization working to advance the economic well-being, safety, and leadership of women and girls across the state of Minnesota. And for 38 years, the Women's Foundation has conducted research, we've made grants and advanced policy to create gender equity. And as Representative Hassan mentioned, as Minnesota, we take, as Minnesotans, we take great pride in our state. As a state, we're often ranked number one or number two in terms of quality of life, 
education attainment, and workforce participation. And we know that the success rate isn't true for all Minnesotans. In fact, you may know that Minnesota is the second worst in the nation for racial disparities. And when you combine these racial disparities with gender disparities, the numbers are alarming. Let's consider the statistic of the wage gap that was mentioned. We know that there's a wage gap between all men and all women in Minnesota. And one trend that we've been following is that while slow progress is being made to close the gap for women who identify as white, for women of color, the gap continues to grow. Representative Hassan mentioned that women of color are earning as low as 45 cents to the dollar earned by white men. This legislation provides critical investments in business, education, and career pathways to meaningfully address the crisis because we know that girls and women of color are not broken. They are not unmotivated. What we need to address are the systems and programming and opportunities that are offered to them. And this bill finally sees women of color in our full identities. We are impacted both by the systems of racism and sexism. So passing this bill would be a historical act for Minnesota. In our most uh, recent listening tour in Minnesota, we learned that what is needed for young women to thrive are opportunities early on in all of the areas we mentioned, business, financial literacy, STEM, academic success. And we know that when young women thrive, their families thrive because young women are playing critical roles in their families, their financial contributors, their caretakers. And so if they are helping families thrive, communities thrive, and then all of us in Minnesota thrive. A number of key recommendations from this bill came from young women and girls themselves across the state. And now I wanna introduce to you a young woman leader from our Young Women's Initiative uh, Cabinet, Mariana Cervetes, a young leader who's working to create change and who will be deeply impacted by this bill as well as her peers. Mariana? Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Mola. Um, Ms. Cervantes, uh, please welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Nora and members of the House Workforce Committee. Uh, thank you for the oppor opportunity to testify on the House Bill 389. My name is Mariana Cervantes, and I recently graduated from Hamlin University in St. Paul. And at Hamlin, I received my bachelor's in criminal justice and legal studies. And currently, I'm a cabinet member on the Young Women's Cabinet. And I also work as a paralegal at a local immigration law firm. So growing up in Minnesota, I have seen firsthand the inequalities that young first-generation immigrant women face. As a first-generation immigrant, my parents were not financially literate compared to many of my parents' friends. I did not grow up learning how to be financially literate, and I did not have the opportunity to learn about real-world finances in middle school or high school. When it came time to take out loans for college, I did not have the knowledge and skills to be able to make informed and effective decisions about a huge financial responsibility. I could take out 100K in loans even before knowing what the difference was between a fixed and variable interest rate. I could not ask my family for help because I would be the first one in my family to attend a four-year university. Luckily for me, I was enrolled in a college readiness program in high school that helped me make significant financial decisions for my future. My teacher noticed that many students in that program were in the same position that I was. She took it upon herself to teach 40 or so students how to make financially conscious decisions. Not all first generation immigrant students had have the opportunity that I did. The young woman color, or sorry, the Women of Color Opportunity Act would invest in women and families just like mine to ensure that young women in Minnesota are able to have the resources they need to make financially conscious decisions. Thank you for your time, and I hope that um, you're able to support the House File 389, the Women of Color Opportunity Act. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your testimony, Ms. Cervantes and Ms. Mola. Uh, this is an important issue. Uh, we will be going today up to 2.45 p.m. Members, we will extend our time to 2.45.
with that, I just wanted to ask if there's any question. I see two members raising their hand, three. We'll start with uh, Representative Haley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, apologize for my tardiness today getting off the floor. Um, thank you for bringing the bill forward, Representative Hassan. Um, and there are many aspects of the bill that I really applaud. Um, the financial literacy, it's important for um, all kids. I know we have a bill moving through the Education Committee. I think it is uh, Representative Erdahl's bill to require that type of a class for all high school kids. Um, uh, Mariana, you are not alone. <laughs> uh, I have um, my son and daughter are similar ages to you, and it is a challenge we know for um, all young people, and particularly with college costs and the difficulty in financing. So you're not alone. Um, I, and I, I appreciate your testimony. I also um, really uh, uh, appreciate just the advancement of women. And I know there's an, an, another bill, a Teachers of Color bill. I believe it's Representative Krisha, and I think I'm a co author. Uh, moving through the Education Committee. And on the STEM front, um, Representative Hassan, I just, I had a question. If you know, of, are there other programs indeed that are specifically targeting uh, high school students and encouraging them to get into STEM careers? Representative Hassan, or should we ask uh, uh, the nonpartisan staff for that? I think, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Haley, I believe Deed, someone from Deed is on the call. I don't know if they want to take that. I'm not sure if there is a program or not. So, uh, we'll, we'll go to the nonpartisan staff. Uh, Ms. Sholin, I don't know if you are able to respond to that question. Uh, Chair and members, I, I actually think Deed would be best able to answer that. I am not aware of any such program. I don't see anyone from DEED unless I'm not seeing them on my list here. Uh, I only see uh, Commissioner uh, McKinnon, Deputy Commissioner McKinnon. I don't know if you are able to respond to that question on a workforce and other programs. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Kevin McKinnon, Deputy Commissioner at DEED. Um, unfortunately, I cannot answer that uh, question. That's a workforce uh, development um, program question, so, but we, we can certainly get that information to you. I appreciate it, thank you. Uh, Representative Haley, as, as promised, uh, we'll, we'll look forward to getting that information from DEEP. Uh, thank you, Chair Noor, um, and thank you, Representative Hassan. Um, as I said, there's many aspects of, of the bill I support, and um, I do have concern just the, setting the precedent of uh, passing the bill forward without a uh, fiscal note. Um, for the areas that we do have jurisdiction over. So I, I just want to mention that. Um, I will support it today, but I, I am hopeful that we could see this bill back as you continue to work on it. Uh, you have you know, a lot of broad areas covered in this uh, particular act, and I would like for us to have the opportunity to see it again as you continue to work on the details. Um, thank you, Representative Hassan. Uh, thank you, Representative Haley. The next person is Representative Cotizo Tun. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Hazan, thank you for bringing this bill forward um, and, and continuing to carry it after um, uh, Representative Moran did uh, previously. And I, I think it's a great bill. I think that um, this is such an important um, topic to consider. It really it has, it has, sorry, the, the baby is crawling into the dog dish behind me. Um, <laughs> the, um, there's so many things that are encapsulated within this, this proposal, and I appreciate um, you putting them all together. I'm particularly intrigued uh, and supportive of the small business development section. I think, you know, I've, I, in, in my district, I have so many uh, women of color who are some of the most enterprising people that I've ever met. And I think that, um, you know, sometimes it, it feels like the, the way that the systems have been set up thus far historically, um, sometimes it's really hard for, for um, women and girls of color to kind of break through that, you know, that, that glass ceiling, if you will. And, and it's certainly harder for um, our BIPOC communities. And I think that um, this um, making sure that they are able to see themselves and that they're getting the education that they need and the supports that they need to kind of continue along that path and continue climbing the ladder. Um, I know that so many of our employers here around the Twin Cities are still continually looking for ways to diversify uh, their, their staff and hire um, 
women of color, people of color, and, and really uh, particularly in, in the STEM um, community. And, um, and I think that this is just one way that we can do that, help to support that as, as a legislature and really um, support these um, members of our community and uh, continually support the economy of Minnesota down the line. Uh, thank you so much, Representative uh, Tun. And it's the environment that we're working in, so anything can happen behind us. Uh, Lead Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Representative Katisa Latu. And I want to say the same thing that Chair, uh, Mr. Chairman, said as well. Bring a smile to your face. To see the children run through there. Um, uh, I brought up my concerns around the the DE one amendment, and uh, so. Mr. Chairman, yourself and Representative Hassan, thank you for your commitment to, to work with us on that and potentially bring the bill back. Uh, Representative Haley brought up, uh, just reiterate, uh, uh, reiterated what my concerns were as well about having those, um, those lines in Article 6 and Article 7 not filled in. So passing this out with uh, um, blank appropriations. However, the testimony was very powerful. Thank you to the testifiers. Uh, there are many things that I appreciate about this bill as well. I'll be supporting this coming out of committee, but again, um, again, I just want to stress um, my thanks to the author and the chair to work with the minority here, work with us uh, to, to answer our questions as this moves forward. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Lead Hamilton. With that, I know we have uh, other bills before us. I just wanted to give... Uh, Representative Hassan, closing remarks uh, as the bill is uh, moving forward before I renew the motion. Thank you, everyone, uh, and thank you for this wonderful conversation. And uh, Representative Katisa Watun, it's wonderful to have children around. <laughs> Mine is at daycare, otherwise she'll be just jumping on my lap. Um, this, is, this is about, it's about equity, it's about fairness, it's about making sure that members of our community are not trapped in the cycle of poverty. Uh, Representative Hamilton and uh, Representative Haley, I will both work with you to make sure that we fill in those appropriations. And um, just for the record, the Teachers of Color Act is my bill and the financial literacy is also my bill. <laughs> so those two are mine and they're both getting support from the Senate and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that. But this is also uh, an important bill. And I think that, um, you know, giving women of color and, and young girls of color a chance to see people that look like them, um, you know, making it, people that look like them climbing the ladder of success and advancing on in life. And then also it comes down to being fair. People, when you work, when you and I both work, we should be paid the same. It simply comes down to that. So, um, Thank you for your time and thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members for this opportunity. And I wanna thank my testifiers. They were wonderful and very, very impactful. Thank you, Representative Hassan, to the, and to the testifiers. I renew my motion, House File 389, as amended, be re referred to uh, Education Finance. With that, I'll ask the Committee Legislative Assistance, Mr. Chavez, to take the roll. Chair North. Aye. Chair Nor, aye. Vice Chair Jay Zhong is excused. A lead Hamilton? Aye. Lead Hamilton, aye. Baker? Baker? Dabney? Dabney, aye. Dabney, aye. Frankie? Frankie, aye. Frankie, aye. Greenman? Greenman, aye. Greenman, aye. Haley? Haley, aye. Haley, aye. Jurgens? Aye. Jurgens, aye. Kegel? Aye. Kegel, aye. Katiza Watoon? Aye. Katiza Watoon, aye. Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Tujong? Aye. Tujong, aye. Baker? Baker? Mr. Chair, we, uh, the motion prevails with 11 ayes and two excused. With 11 eyes and two excused, uh, the motion prevails. Uh, you are on your way, Representative Hassan. The next bill is House File 1364 with uh, Representative Tu Zhong. Uh, we appreciate your statement today on the floor, and we are all together in this. So thank you so much. Uh, please uh, move your bill and uh, proceed uh, uh, with your testimony. Hello, Chair Nora. I'd like to move uh, House File 1364. For uh, possible inclusion, uh, please please proceed. 
Uh, I think there's a, I would like to introduce the DE2 amendment. Uh, DE2 amendment, can you explain uh, the DE2 amendment, uh, Representative Tujo? Uh, would I do the motion before the presentation? Would you uh, like to have yes. a motion prior? I'd like to move the DE2 amendment. Uh, the amendment essentially merges the original language of this bill with Representative Hassan's um, House File 1072. Uh, the rising, imp rising impact is a new entity uh, formed by the merger of, the, of several organizations that have received this grant funding in the past via Youth Prize. And now our uh, and are now positioned to partner with Youth Prize in jointly requesting the funds and receiving a significant portion of them to carry out the work. Um, this amendment uh, stipulates that Rising Impact would receive half the funds appropriated, while Youth Prize would still administer the grant funds to both Rising Impact and other organizations. Uh, thank you, Representative Tujong. Uh, you, uh, I just wanted to uh, let members know that we will be uh, laying this bill over for possible inclusion. With that, I, I wanted to ask all those in favor for DE2 amendment, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Aye. See none, motion prevails. Uh, to your bill as amended, uh, Representative Tujong. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this bill continues the important investment uh, for the state uh, for, by the state of Minnesota, uh, which has been made since 2017 in ensuring East African youth uh, so that they are prepared for and can successfully transition into the state's workforce. Um, it appropriates money to Youth Prize to make subgrants to organizations who provide economic development services designed to enhance long-term economic self-sufficiency in communities with concentrated um, East African population. Um, in addition to directing 50% uh, of the funds to rising impact, uh, as I said earlier, it aims for 50% uh, of the subgrants to go to communities outside the seven county metro area to ensure services are reaching um, East African youth uh, throughout the state, especially given the challenging labor market conditions now. Um, and I don't, you know, we feel that it's not the, should not be a, a time where we back out uh, from this inv important investment in the future of our labor force. Um, and then to underscore a point, I'm pleased to, to have two testifiers with me today uh, who can speak to the impact of these grant dollars. Um, Marcus Pope uh, of Youth Prize and Mohamed Farah uh, at uh, Rising Impact. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Representative Tu Zhong. Uh, I would like to start with uh, Mr. Pope. Welcome to the committee. Please uh, state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Marcus Pope, Vice President of Youth Prize. The mission of Youth Prize is to increase equity with and for Minnesota's indigenous, low income and racially diverse youth. Since our inception in 2011, we have worked closely with the East African community to identify needs, provide funding and technical assistance to a group of nonprofits poised for impact and growth. We have also educated funders and made connections in an effort to leverage additional resources. In 2017, we worked closely with community leaders to secure state funding in support of the East African community, which Youth Prize has administered through a competitive process. Our most recent round of funding supports career exploration and planning, internship and apprenticeship placement, education and language support, mentoring, and many other services. This past grant cycle, the funding went to 17 organizations in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Moorhead, Wilmer, Northfield, Faribault, and Rochester. Many of these grantees are small community-based organizations who depend on this funding. Losing it would compromise their ability to continue their programming at a time when workforce assistance is needed more than ever. 
In just the first three quarters of 2020, for which data is currently available, the recipients of these grant funds provided career exploration and planning to 1,200 youth, work readiness training to 458 youth, mentoring to 588 youth, and entrepreneurship services to 432 youth. These grantees provided individualized support and adjust their services based on the changing labor market conditions. For example, the South Sudanese Foundation in Moorhead, in addition to providing transportation, job placement, and translation, has been helping youth laid off because of COVID with their unemployment insurance applications while they help them find new opportunities. Like two youth who received CNA certificates and are now working at a nursing home and three youth who were able to complete a forklift class who are now working at a warehouse. Islamic Civic Society of America in Minneapolis has developed an innovative service learning model that connects youth to community leaders and has spurred several students to pursue teaching careers, but they don't stop there. They connect youth with a program at Augsburg that provides scholarship funding and other supports to aspiring teachers on their journey to the classroom. It's important to understand that many of these grantees are small and Youth Prize provides a great deal of technical assistance to help ensure compliance with requirements that come with state funding. We are well positioned to do this, even given that we have granted out over 50 $40 million in support to small nonprofits. However, we're proud that several of our East African-led partners have now matured in our position for greater impact, even during this difficult time. Rising Impact, who you will hear from next, next is one example of the possibilities when we invest in East African-led nonprofits. In closing, Youth Prize has seen firsthand through our leading role on the Youth Unemployment Insurance Campaign just how challenging this labor market has been for young people. Now is the time to double down on this funding and ensure East African youth across Minnesota have access to the resources they need to be productive workers today and into the future. I urge you to include HF 1364 in the Omnibus Jobs Bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Pope. The next person is Mr. Farah. Welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, good afternoon. I would like to thank Representative Chiang for his leadership to bring uh, this bill before you today. My name is Mohamed Farah. I am the Executive Director of Rising Impact, a, a nationally recognized Somali youth organization tailored towards enriching the lives of Somali American youth by utilizing the positive elements of education, mentoring, employment, and the arts. On behalf of the Somali on behalf of the Somali Minnesota youth and all Minnesotans really, I urge you to support uh, House File 1364. The mission of Rising Impact is to create a better world by providing community-based, culturally specific programs and services to youth and their families through education, the arts and economic development. We are a statewide organization that works primarily with the East African community across the state. Providing an avenue of employment and setting career pathways is the center of what we do. We believe we have a role to play in increasing a more, creating a more diverse workforce, starting with our youth. Our East African Youth at Work program creates a two-way opportunity. We help youth gain on-the-job experience, and we also help employers create work places that are more culturally aware. We combat workplace discrimination by building relationships and trust with respected employers and giving them practical ways of creating a more welcoming multicultural work environment. The East African Youth at Work program builds job skills for East African youth across our state and positions them for employment successes through internship placements, career exploration, soft skills development, and mentorship. All participants who successfully complete the program received career assessment and exploration services, an individualized work plan, and paid internship or job placements. Over 311 of youth have completed the, pro the program thus far, and they have or have job sought in various careers, such as information technology, health sector, accounting, 
business management or marketing, business administration, public service, social work or case management, providing hands-on training is an essential part in the program. These trainings improve their productivity, builds their capacity, and builds their knowledge and skills that are needed in various industries. Examples of these trainings include, but not limited to, certified nursing assistant, Java coding, web design, graphic design, digital marketing, database administrator, and AWS training codes. With the support of this committee, we can continue to do some great work throughout Minnesota. This committee and the state of Minnesota have partners like Youth Prize and Rising Impact who have been on the ground for many years in the community. This committee understands, of all committees, this committee particularly understands the racial inequalities that exist in Minnesota. And I cannot stress enough about the work that must be done for our communities of color across Minnesota. So once again, I urge you to support this bill. I would like to thank Representative Xiang again for his leadership. And I also would like to thank Representative Noor for hearing this bill. Thank you so much. Members, any questions or comments? We have two more bills. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that you get that opportunity. This bill Mr. will be laid over. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and just to uh, com uh, just to comment uh, to the testifiers, um, I also serve on a committee chaired by Representative Pulowski, and we put a strong effort on the career tech type of professions, uh, individuals in construction, elect um, electricians, plumbers, welders, etc. These are honorable, honorable professions, and as uh, the testifier was talking about some of the career pathways. I just want to stress that uh, this career tech, some of these other pathways too, are, are very honorable professions, and there's a lot of lot of opportunity there as well. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, the last person will be Representative Juggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I guess probably to the to the bill author. I'm just curious if you considered uh, having these grants come directly from Deed uh, to kind of to cut out the middleman. If there'd be any cost savings there, is that, is that something you considered? If I may answer that quickly, as you have had from previous discussions, I think the direction that Deed has already requested is to go, uh, you know, to uh, not to include any direct appropriation. This is more to ensure that uh, we do have a plan going forward. So I just wanted to reassure everybody again, uh, we have been talking about, about, you know, removing the direct appropriation as we will be discussing uh, once we have the budget targets and how we proceed forward. Representative Zhang, uh, to Zhang, did you want to comment? Uh, I, I was just reiterating what the chair said, and uh, yeah, and I, and I think it's uh, you know something that uh, the nonprofit uh, has really good connections with the community, and so uh, not, nothing further. All right, with that, Representative Tu Zhang renews his motion. Uh, House file. 1364 as amended uh, to be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you so much. Uh, the next bill goes back to you, uh, Representative Zhang, uh, 20 House File 2019. Please move your bill and let's proceed with that. Uh, hello, Chair. I would like to move um, House File 2019 for possible inclusion. Uh, please proceed with the bill as is. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll try, try to be brief so that we make it on time. Uh, uh, House File 2019 would appropriate uh, $2 million to propel nonprofits um, and intermedi intermediary organization, which provides technical assistance um, and regrants the funds in a competitive process to small, co culturally specific nonprofits throughout, uh, throughout the state. Uh, this nonprofit uh, in infrastructure grant program has been extremely successful, and I'm, I am here along with the recipients of the program to urge continued support uh, of the nonprofit organizations that serve historically underserved communities. Um, I have with me here uh, with uh, I have Kate Barr, uh, Nashina Hussein. Uh, Mukhtar Ibrahim, Nancy Foshing, and Jonathan Palmer. 
Uh, thank you. To the testifiers, if you can be brief uh, as we get to the um, uh, end of the uh, committee hearing. Uh, Ms. Barr, welcome. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Noor and members of the committee. My name is Kate Barr, president of Propel Nonprofits. Our work in supporting nonprofits leads me to support House File 2019. Propel received appropriations from the state in 2017 and 2019 to create this grant program to build the infrastructure and uh, organizational capacity of small culturally specific nonprofits uh, that serve historically underserved communities. When these nonprofits are strengthened, their communities are benefit from expanded services and support. And the grantees of this nonprofit infrastructure grant program located across the state have made great progress in building their capacity and increasing their staff and program services. So I ask for your support to continue and expand this grant program. You know, the state is home to many well-established and sizable nonprofits delivering high quality services. Smaller nonprofits are equally important and valuable. The number of nonprofits that are led by and serving people of color and indigenous people has been growing. And these nonprofits are employers whose capacity to serve their communities delivers multiple returns for our economy and state. This has been evident over the last year as nonprofits have stretched to respond to the greater needs in their community brought about by COVID-19 and other crises. We learned through this grant program that these nonprofits are uniquely responsive and relevant in their community and flourish with support for infrastructure, adequate staffing and operational systems as you'll hear in a few minutes. Demand for the program is high. In 2019, we received 106 applications for $4.2 million from a diverse range of nonprofits with 20% of applicants located in greater Minnesota. We were only able to support 10% of these applicants with the funds we had available. The selections are made through a rigorous competitive grant process with a 13 member uh, grant review panel. Also, small nonprofits face barriers in accessing grants from state agencies. So these grants were designed to be a path to readiness for direct state funding. We hold the organizations to a high standard of for fiscal management policies and reporting, and they've met that standard and strengthened their organizations. With the technical assistance they receive from Propel in fiscal and grant management, these grantees report that they've developed the capacity to manage state grants in the future. This approach to strengthening nonprofit infrastructure helps move our state closer to reducing disparities in employment, education, and other areas. Your support of this bill will continue and expand this established grant program and benefit communities in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much. The next person I have is Ms. Hussein. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Noor and the Workforce Development Committee members. My name is Noshina Hussein, and I'm the Executive Director of Reviving the Islamic Sisterhood for Empowerment. I'm here to support House File 2019. RISE used the funding provided by the Nonprofit Infrastructure Grant Program. We use the funding to upgrade our operational systems, create a strategic com communications plan, which is really critical structures that make us effective and responsive to the needs of our community. During the pandemic, the uprising, and the, in the midst of a presidential election and census, we needed to have a strong digital presence and needed the capabilities to administer that. Because there were no in-person events, everything had to go online, including keeping our community safe, mutual aid coordination, voting from home, and completing the census. We needed to also keep our systems and people safe from Zoom bombing, doxing, and online harassment. Moving to a safer digital environment allowed us to reach Muslim women, not just based in the Twin Cities, but statewide. Stre strengthening infrastructure won't be one and done project. This was one of our strategic plans goals and will continue to be on our future plans for sustainability. Oftentimes, funding doesn't exist to support building infrastructure. And if it does, it rarely is accessible to black indigenous communities of color. We see federal and state aid responding to the pandemic and the uprising. However, the nonprofit sector is not eligible to access these dollars often. We are grateful to Propel Nonprofits for being the intermediary and guiding us through this process. 
As you consider funding for the Nonprofit Infrastructure Grant Program, please remember that the process shouldn't be competitive in receiving funding, but it should be equitable. Cultural organizations cannot continue to be subcontractors for larger nonprofits. With funding and technical assistance, culturally specific organizations can leverage connections, relationships, partnerships with state agencies, other grant makers, and build a stronger Minnesota. As anti-Blackness, xenophobia, and white supremacy plague our country, this grant is one example of centering the needs of, the, of some of the most vulnerable populations in our state. I ask you to support House File 2019 and appropriate $2 million to provide technical assistance and to strengthen the infrastructure of nonprofits that serve the most marginal members of our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hussain. The next person is Mr. Palmer. Welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, good afternoon, uh, the Chair Noor and, and members of the committee. Um, my name is Jonathan Palmer. I'm the executive director of Halley Q. Brown Community Center. I believe I was coming to speak towards the amendment, which may not have been introduced at this point regarding the nonprofit assistance recovery fund. All right, I was looking for the other person who was supposed to testify, Mr. Ibrahim. Uh, I don't see him on the account, so uh, we will go, go ahead. Chair, no, I think he provided a written testimony instead. Uh, great, He's so early. with that, I wanted to move uh, the amendment, uh, which is, I believe is 821 amendment. Uh, to the bill, and I have uh, a friend who will help me. Uh, Representative Hollins, uh, if you're available to explain some of the components for the uh, A21 amendment, uh, welcome to the committee and uh, proceed. Thank you much. Thank you so much, Chair Noor, and thank you, committee members. I apologize that I am not um, visible. I am actually in the car right now. Um, but I am very excited to bring the amendment to House File 2019. Um, uh, this, this is an amendment to create a nonprofit resiliency and recovery fund. Um, it would be an appropriation of $30 million, which would be doled out in grants um, administrated by DEED um, and would provide critical investment in nonprofit organizations that are delivering essential services to Minnesotans across the state. Um, really, we are looking for a way to support the um, local nonprofit sector that are providing such um, amazing um, services for all of our Minnesotans um, and helping us navigate this crisis and um, help them survive the COVID-19 pandemic and hopefully um, rebuild as we move towards a more normal uh, way of life. So um, this would be, an, um, as I mentioned, this would be $30 million um, in grants that would be administered by DEED. Um, we are looking at dividing those that amount evenly between the Metro and greater Minnesota. We have not yet um, established how the process would go. We're looking at a lottery system and we think that's probably the best way to do it equitably um, and to also move the funds out as quickly as possible to those who need them. Um, but we are in communication with DEED currently on um, how best to do that. And I do have two testifiers here to speak to this. Um, and I think you called on, on one of them, Mr. Jonathan Palmer, who um, is the executive director of the Haley Q. Brown Community Center. And if he's available to speak, that would be um, wonderful. So I've already moved to A21. Any discussions, members? So, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Lead Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this has taken the, uh, the appropriation from 2 million to 30 million. Is that accurate? So if you look at the bill, there are two separate sections. Uh, this uh, amendment adds a, a component using the American Rescue uh, Plan, uh, which will allow as component of household uh, needs. So this is separate section to that bill. So when you look at it, it's, it's, it's two funding streams as it, it's written right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Seeing none, the motion prevails. We now have the bill as amended uh, to that. Uh, Mr. Palmer, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Jonathan Palmer. I'm the executive director of Cali Key Brown Community Center. We are a 92-year-old African-American social service agency located in St. Paul, Minnesota. The pandemic has had a disastrous effect on the nonprofit community due to the greatest increase in need, uh, but the smaller amounts of resources that have been there. Uh, when the pandemic hit last year, our organization was one of many that provides essential services that was asked to stay open. We have never closed our doors, but the need went exponentially higher. Uh, we saw a 4,000% increase in new clients in our food shelf, um, and we have focused in on that as well as our education piece. Uh, for context, in March of 2020, we enrolled 108 new clients in our food shelf. In June of 2020, we enrolled 1,808 new clients. Um, and for context, in June of 2019, we enrolled 69 new clients. So the need has grown exponentially. We've been working uh, to get food out. We, pre, prior to the pandemic, were just serving St. Paul area. We're now serving all over the state. Uh, we were able to maintain a client choice model when a lot of food shelves had to go to a pre-packed box. We've added delivery and other services. All of these are things that are necessary for families and the communities to maintain some level, maintain some level of stability, to be able to address the needs in keeping their families uh, safe and as well as going ahead and keeping them fed. The issue behind the client choice goes to the fact that people have to um, look at food allergies, they have to look at religious preferences, things beyond that, as well as the emergency supplies that we provide. So there's a great need here for nonprofits to be able to have access to a fund that will help them stabilize to grow and continue to meet the need. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the last testifier on this amendment and the bill is Ms. Fashing. Welcome to the committee. Uh, state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Nancy Fashing. I'm the Vice President for Community Impact at the Southwest Initiative, uh, Southwest Initiative Foundation in Hutchinson, serving the Southwest corner of the state um, in the 18 counties and two native nations in that region. The number of nonprofits in our region was lean at the onset of the pandemic. When we consider how the pandemic showed us that the cracks in our disparities have now become fault lines, it underscores the imperative need we have to support the nonprofit sector. When this thing first hit, our non it was our nonprofits that we turned to to serve the most cr critical needs of our community members food shelves and support programs, mental health services, critical medical care, and basic needs and safety. This sector supports our most vulnerable. Another example of how the pandemic has hit our liveliness is the shuttering of the doors of local nonprofit venues like the Barn Theater in Wilmer. It has been dark for over a year. Capacity limits don't provide the revenues to sustain operations. They are considering creative models to deliver programs, but without funding, it's not possible. This sector supports our community vitality. Senior centers and developmental support organizations has, have also been hard hit. They have, pivot, have had to pivot their operations in new ways with technology and move to online programming. They are having to reimagine what the future looks like for the much anticipated return to socialization that we are all looking forward to. This sector supports our quality of life. The sense of urgency to build nonprofits focused on culturally inclusive needs and care is apparent. A group of young BIPOC women formed the nonprofit, the Creative Healing Space in Worthington in January. Mr. Yes. I didn't want to cut you off. I know we are over the schedule that we have been allocated. Uh, I just wanted to get this bill laid over. And uh, to the members, we're going to, uh, uh, I will be calling for re uh, recess, but I appreciate your testimony. Uh, with that, members, uh, Representative Tujong renews his motion, House File 2019, as amended uh, to be laid over for possible inclusion. I now call uh, to recess, uh, call to the, uh, of the chair. So we will be moving to recess to 
make sure that we can pick up the last bill that we have. So thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Chairman, about what time? Can you send out an email? Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Travis Rees will be sending that information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Provide as much notice as I can. I will need to check in with both House TV.